Hi, I'm Mark Marshall. In this series of video blogs, I'm going to start from the beginning stage of composing a song, and I'm going to follow it through all the way through the mastering process. And uh, through this, you're going to get a lot of good tips about the various stages of the recording process. We're going to talk about developing scratch tracks to be able to send out to uh, pianists and drummers. Uh, we're going to talk about the things that we could do to prepare mixes to get ready to send to a mixing engineer, how to communicate with a master mastering engineer to get the type of master that you're looking for. I'm going to get in depth about um, developing certain guitar tones and bass tones. I'm going to talk about using certain plugins to help the creation process such as using uh, Keyscape to get piano sounds that, that are, are very realistic in order to um, simplify the recording process so we can have flexibility in editing after a take has been done. I'm going to show you how to use uh, Easy Drummer to develop a scratch drum track to send to your drummer so that they have a good concept of the feel that you're going for. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of various tools that we can use to aid the process so that by the time you start hiring musicians, the community will become a lot easier. I'll discuss in detail some of my decision making with miking, with uh, processing, I'll discuss some of my decision making in arrangement and uh, such thing as getting sessions prepped. I'll be taking some time to solo all the tracks so you can hear each individual instrument and how it was recorded and what it sounds like from the recording process to the mixing process to the mastering stage so you have a good idea of where things should be sounding at, uh, at every uh, turn that you make in your production. The intention with this series was to remove a lot of the mystery behind the process. I think that people often only get to hear the finished project and when they're working on their own projects, sometimes they feel a little insecure about it because they don't know how a project is supposed to sound with the raw tracks before it's been mixed and before it's been mastered. So you'll get an idea of, uh, of where things should be sitting. now. Some of this stuff may change depending on the type of project that you're working on, but what you'll hear in this video is a pretty general approach that I make for most genres of music that I work on as far as the various stages of sound that the project reaches. I hope you'll enjoy this process as much as I did. This song was composed by myself and my wife, Abby Ahmed. We were lucky enough to work with some of the finest musicians on air gigs. This was an international session, so you'll see people from both sides of the pond, as we say. It's primarily American and, uh, and English on this particular song. Uh, but this is a, a great example of how things can work in the modern world, and just because you're not living in a major city doesn't mean that you can't have access to some of the, the top musicians that exist and they can help you bring your song to life. I'll talk a little bit about stage one for me in composing. Uh, when I'm composing, I like to sit down with uh, the piano and a piece of uh, staff paper. Uh, you don't have to read or write music in order to, to compose. Uh, I like it because uh, it, for me it saves me time as opposed to having to go through voice memos on my phone. Uh, and a lot of people nowadays just use voice memos, uh, but I, I find it a little frustrating to have to you know, go through three minutes of me working over the same idea to find the one spot where I got the chord progression right. So for that, like I use uh, staff paper paper to write out uh, my ideas as they're coming up the chord cycle or sometimes even if I have any uh, specific melodic ideas I'll I'll jot them down on paper for this particular composition I was mainly just using it to write down uh, the chord cycles and eventually the form uh, so I wrote it in pieces I, I initially came up with the verse and uh, and then of course the chorus followed and so it took a little bit to kind of piece those uh, parts together and figure out how long I wanted each one to last for uh, and you'll see me like making notes on the paper here and, and working on it uh, from here uh, I, I eventually found a bridge that I wanted to add in uh, and I started to, to get a vibe of, of how I wanted the form of the song 
to be. Uh, I think the last thing to be added was actually the intro. Uh, I had a, a, a sense of, uh, of the outro wanting to almost be like a, a double chorus uh, and build. So I had that in the back of my mind. Uh, and once I added the bridge, it came to me that maybe I want a, a shortened bridge to be the, the intro. So I added that in. Now, there's a million ways that you can compose and, and deal with form. How I, I arranged it or, or put the form together, I think, isn't as important as the the idea that I think it's really important to uh, to make sure that you have your form pretty tight when you start sending it out. I think don't leave any loose ends. Don't leave intros to be determined or or an outro that you're not really sure of. Uh, those things are really hard to fix later. So by the time you're adding drums and, and, and stuff, it's uh it's going to be really hard to, to add in a guitar. Or, or to change things. So uh, the pre-production for me is always really, really important. I try to make sure that, that I have it buttoned up relatively tight. Now, I mentioned that I'm sending this off to uh, a lyricist vocalist first for them to work on. So it's going to be a little bit malleable in the sense that I'm not adding a bunch of other parts yet. We're going to work from the scratch piano melody line. And then once things uh, jive with the, the vocalist, then I'm going to really, really lock it down. But uh, I try even before I send off to uh, a lyricist vocalist to make sure that I have some sort of tight form happening. Writing the tempo down pretty early on in the composition process I feel is really important because I think when you're first writing a song, you're writing it from a pretty pure feeling and more often than not, you know where that tempo or where that song is supposed to sit. So I like to uh, have a, an app on my phone. I use Tempo or I also sometimes keep Logic open and I set up a key command to do a tap tempo on it. Some people don't realize that there's a tap tempo option in Logic, but it's really great. And, uh, and this is convenient because a lot of times if I'm writing on piano, I have Logic open anyway, and I have Keyscape open so I can you know, play with a Wurlitzer or a piano. Or, uh, so it makes sense to, 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 for me to be working in that environment sometimes. Um, but if I'm not working in Logic, I'll be using a guitar, in which case I would just use the Tempo app. One of the things that happens over time when you keep hashing out ideas for the songs is that the tempos start to jump and skip. And a lot of times when people start moving their projects into Logic or Pro Tools or whatever da you use, uh, the tempo radically changes because they're uh, they're they're not tapping it in. They're they're just kind of scrolling through the the metronome and and it throws off your 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 equilibrium as far as the the natural tempo of the song is and it's, it's hard to check in with that so that's why uh, and there's a good idea to use the voice recorder for make sure you record yourself playing it early on and then get your tap tempo however way whatever device you want to go about getting that and just checking in it making sure you know what that original tempo is and write it down write it down on a piece of paper put it in your, your logic session you know save it uh, label it make sure you're labeling everything really clearly one last thing I like to do is I like to use the voice recorder on my phone to record me talking about uh, some notes as the song is playing through. So I'll leave the guitar melody in and the piano in and I have my iPhone and I'm just going to talk through it and say like, well, you know, this, um, this vocal line you're hearing in this part, this idea that should be like background vocals only or I hear this bridge getting really big here. Uh, that's a lot easier to to uh, discuss through audio, through a message than it is through text in, a, in an email. I mentioned earlier the tap tempo command in Logic, and I'm gonna show you how to set that up. So if you go into edit, key commands, you see a search tap tempo, and here we go. Tap tempo, it's in the global commands. And, uh, and there it is. I have my end set to smush the bottom three uh, modifier keys and then this uh, forward space. How it works is you hold down the three modifiers and then you tap the, your other assigned key to the tempo that you want to play. And after like about three or four clicks in time, it you'll see the timeline start to move and that means it's grabbed your tempo. Uh, this is a much, much friendlier way to set your tempos in songs. So I use this all the time and I just I have it set up as a, as a default key command. Some of the plugins that I like to use to assist me 
in the pre-production process is Keyscape. Now, when I was um, playing piano and I was writing the song, this is what I was using. Uh, sure, there's a lot of uh, cheaper options as far as getting piano sounds, but I find that having a, a, a really good piano sound it helps me be more creative rather than just some sort of, um, I don't know, lesser quality plugin. So the Keyscape library is, is really awesome. Like it's about as real as it could sound using a plugin. It just stimulates my brain more creatively. So when I'm writing, uh, it makes me feel a little less exposed as a, as a bad piano player. But if you're a good piano player, you could really get a lot of mileage out of this. So this is always in my uh, template for writing. I can pull it up and I can immediately have something that sounds good and start writing on it. Uh, as far as that, I, I do like a little bit of reverb and and uh, like basically with my template, I try to set things up that are going to immediately sound good, so I feel more more creative. Right, that's a that's a common uh, element that you're going to notice here. Uh, and I have a, an EMT plate reverb from UAD set up as well, which I I, I feed the piano to uh, just to make it sound. I don't know, a little bit more dreamy. Now, I dropped in a piano part, which we'll hear here. Let's listen to a little bit of it. There you have the isolated piano track. I, I had a melody line that I was working with and I laid that in with guitar. I'm expecting the uh, the vocalist to take a lot of liberties with this. So I just kind of played a basic melody line and improvised a little bit just to, to kind of set the uh, the groundwork or, or create a little bit of a, a, a vibe. I had a little piece of a melody line that I wanted to work from. And so I picked up my guitar because I was more comfortable with that and I knew it was going to give me a little more flexibility when laying out a, a temporary guide melody. Uh, so the idea with this is I improvised a lot. I had a figure that I start off the verse with, and then I just improvised a little bit just to, to I don't know, get, give a little um, map of maybe where you know the the improvisation or the the, the melody writing can go. Let's listen. <laughs> have uh, I think that's going to be enough to work from 
one more thing worth mentioning. Again, I, I tried to make the guitar sound good, so I mic'd up a, a Vox AC15 and used my Gibson 335 and uh, put a nice ribbon mic on it. And I, you know, I have a little bit of um, 1176 on here. I, I think when I'm doing these scratch processes, you're going to see a familiar theme that I try to get really good sounds at every stage. I don't really think of there being a point where I don't know the um, the quality doesn't matter because you never know what you're gonna keep later. There might be a phrase, there might be a, a chord cycle. Uh, there's a lot you can use, so always approach it as if something is going to be a keeper. Try to get it in time. Try to get the tone good. Make sure your instruments are always in tune. Uh, make sure you're using you know the right guitar. And there's not a lot of buzz. Uh, all these elements, like try to capture everything right from the get-go. As you can see, I'm on the Air Gigs website. I have the profile up for a singer named Abby Ahmed. Abby happens to be my wife, and we discussed working on this track together. She wanted to uh, write some lyrics to it, uh, but I thought it would be a good idea to um, follow this process through completely online so I can document it through this blog just to, to give everybody an idea of uh, the way I, I approach these things, the way we communicate back and forth when we're developing a melody line, when we're tweaking lyrics, uh, if we have to make any changes to the form. Uh, so in the next blog, uh, I'm going to show you how I wrote the email and, and if I talked about any reference tracks, what I delivered for her to check out, which will be two tracks. One will be with the guitar and the piano with the faux melody line and the other one will just be the piano that she can uh, work out some ideas on her own uh, and then from there on out we're going to contact and work with musicians the same exact way the drummer uh, the pianist the mixing engineer and the mastering engineer one of the reasons i think abby is a really good fit for this particular song is she can do a lot of really great classic blues and uh, r&b type styles of singing but she also is tapped into a lot of uh, modern music and and rock and contemporary music and i think that i didn't really want this song to be a straight knockoff of um old gospel type r&b uh, i want to be infused with that flavor but i'm okay with it it kind of making a Y in the road a little bit and and uh, developing its own identity so let's start off by sending her a message Okay, I finished the email and basically uh, I reached out and, and made a few comments about the two different files I'm sending. Also, it gave some references. I felt like Amy Winehouse was a good reference, a, a good ballpark to be putting the style in, as well as uh, there's a really great song from Lake Street Dive called What Am I Doing Here? I think is also a really good you know, starting point to, to give a vocalist to, to head them in the right direction. We're going to see what she responds with as far as like ideas and, and how she feels she could treat the song. And from that point, we'll, we'll start a, an actual session and begin our work process. Even though I'm still waiting to hear back about the direction for the lyrics and how the melody line is going to influence the, the arrangement, I'm going to get started on laying out some demo tracks for the drums because I'm going to want to contact a drummer and start that discussion as well. For this, there's a couple tools you can use. Uh, my favorite happens to be Easy Drummer uh, because it, it, you know, it, it's like the name implies, it is pretty easy and uh, you can get up and running with like a, a groove pretty fast. I have a bunch of different of these expansion drum kits, but I'm going to start with basically with the vintage because I, I like vintage sounding drums. The best thing to do before you start getting too deep into this is to try to get some sort of an idea of what kind of drum groove you want to have, right? Maybe where you want the dynamic shifts to be. So there's two ways I can approach this from within Easy Drummer. I could use a MIDI keyboard and I could play some notes. And I could just drop them in. 
you know, and I can quantize things later if I want. But if you don't feel like you're really great at being able to play the part in, you can use a really great feature inside of Easy Drummer, which is this tap to find, which is going to let us build it in pieces and it's going to quantize it. And what then it'll do is it'll search its whole database of MIDI files and it'll tell you which ones are the closest match to what you played. Uh, this is really, really nice for just kind of like throwing parts in as, as ideas. I'm going to show you. Let me tap on this. I could add the snare drum now. I hit the show results option and now okay, there's a bunch of options here. 100% match. So there we go, I found the one I liked, and I'm just gonna drag it out of here, and I'm gonna throw it right on the, the timeline right here. Let's see what happens. Now I think I'm feeling like once we get into this first section here, that uh, that I want it to break down a little bit. So I'm gonna adjust this here. I'm gonna go into the matrix view here and uh, I'm gonna find the hi-hats. There they are. And I'm just gonna get rid of them because I feel like maybe just bass drum and snare drum on their own is gonna be really nice there. don't want to fill. I think one thing to be mindful too is that you don't really have to go crazy with drum fills of this. You know, the I think the drummer is gonna gonna feel like where to put them. And even when you're talking about pre-production, you can maybe make a mention that I don't want too many fills, or I want to fill leading into the chorus, or you can make those sort of notes. But I don't think you have to spend a lot of time and painstakingly the creating drum fills or searching through your database. I think that uh, it, every drummer, if left to their own will will create some really tasty drum fills especially when you're hiring a top-notch session musician Open up Easy Drummer again because I actually do hear a build up there. So this is one of those cases where I feel like the um, the drum part being specific is maybe a little important. I'm gonna just tap to find here. I'm gonna clear this out. And there we go, we found our buildup. So I'm gonna kill this region here and I'm gonna drag this in. I'm not sure which half of that I'm gonna use because uh, they are both different dynamics but I know I want the first half of this region here. So I'm, I'm just, I'm listening pretty carefully to the parts. That one's perfect. Uh, so now we're gonna go back to our, our groove. See what we found.
I like the idea of the ride cymbal playing in the chorus. And dynamically for this second verse it would be nice to have hi-hat there the first verse was very stripped down with just bass drum and snare drum so let's see what the second verse sounds like again I just I'm pulling from this pool right here that had all these different options in it that we got matched <laughs> Okay, at the end of this second pre-chorus, I'm gonna do a very similar thing. We're gonna pull this build up. I'm gonna grab the, the groove from our chorus. So for this bridge, I'm wondering what it might sound like to do a double time thing just to bring up the dynamics a little bit. I'm not really sure it's going to work, but I'm going to try it. I didn't exactly find what I wanted for this section, so I'm going to modify this a little bit to uh, to close to the groove that I want. Uh, this one I pulled in from Easy Drummer was the closest to what I wanted, uh, but I want to add some more snare drums here. Pulling down the velocity on that snare drum a little bit because I didn't want to give the wrong impression that that was supposed to be super heavy. but I'm going for a little bit in this bridge is going a little towards like the Joe Cocker Mad Dogs and Englishmen era uh, so I'm kind of gonna stick with this groove for now and see what the drummer thinks and maybe they could do a better job at tying it together uh, so we're coming out of this bridge I might just do a, a build up here um, to uh, to leave a little something for the drummer to make him realize we're gonna do some sort of transition <laughs> I'm gonna pull the chorus vibe for this because I think I want that to be our, our outro. things I'm really hoping to get in this composition by hiring uh, really great musicians is, is the dynamic map of the song. I think sometimes when you're you're laying things in yourself, you're playing piano, uh, it, you're not creating as much of a roller coaster ride with dynamics within the song. But a real player is going to listen to that intro and they're going to gauge how loud that intro should be uh, juxtaposed against that verse when the dynamics come down there and they're going to incrementally adjust the dynamics and I mentioned that that uh, second verse and third verse that both have the hi-hat and bass drum snare drum groove happening uh, it, just because 
it's happening in both those sections doesn't mean they're going to play them in exactly the same dynamics because you're coming out of that bridge so you might have a little bit of a different feeling than coming out of that first chorus uh, and i really think that's some of the things that really make up a song and a really refined player is going to do that they're not really going to going to cut and paste they're going to play through the whole song as a performance to really capture that movement that dynamic movement that's happening i may have a conversation with the drummer about that just so uh, we're on the same page of like where we're gonna go with it dynamically. Where that like, where's the high point of the song? Where's the low point of the song? What you see uh, just by using Easy Drummer and pulling up and using this tap to find option, I was able to to build a drum track just based around a pattern that I knew I was gonna like, and it wasn't that time consuming at all. I think it was honestly uh, the easiest way to build a very quick drum template to send off to somebody you, know, you could just go through the browser and, and search out grooves if you like but I just find it easier to use the, the tap to find because I can you know it, it quantizes it and gives me a lot of suggestions there's tons of suggestions in here next I'll be reaching out to a drummer and starting the discussion much like I did with Abby one other thing worth mentioning about working with musicians, whether it's in person or through the Air Gigs Network, is the idea of signing a work for hire agreement. I think this is important. Uh, this way you have no misunderstandings about what everybody's role is in the process. So basically what the agreement will state is that whoever is coming in, that her work is, um, I'm paying her for her work, and then once she's done with it, she doesn't retain any rights over any publishing or any sort of royalties or anything like that. It was really her, her job was just to be paid to do the initial drum track. This is good not to leave open-ended. Uh, you just don't want any mix uh, communication and people coming back later and saying like, well, hey, I, you know, I added to that song with that drum track and you just sold a you know a couple thousand records and i want some money from that uh so to prevent this we create this agreement that basically makes them sign off on the song and where i'm not going to do this is with a lyricist writer i'm going to uh just basically share some of the writing and publishing with them because i feel like at that point when you're writing lyrics it's it gets into songwriting let's look at an example of a work for hire music agreement I just downloaded this from the web. You do a search, you could find one, and I found a really good one. And basically, in here, uh, you could check it out. You have to put your information in, and then the musician that you're working with, and basically just uh, ask them to sign off on the song so that they can't claim any sort of ownership or copyright or anything at a later time. So I'm going to do this for every musician that I'm working with and I'll probably have a separate contract with Abby since we're going to share some of the writing and, and publishing on that since she's going to be writing. This is a part of the process that a lot of people I don't know, they're a little lackadaisical on because it's not the most fun part. And usually it's all about making the music. But as time goes on, I think people's memories seem to shift a lot about what their contributions were. And I'm not saying that they're not important, but their feelings may change and be like, well, you know, that, that drum fill or that chord that opens a song really sets the whole thing up. And, and I feel like I want a writer share now and so uh having that initial agreement while you're making the music you know make sure if you're creatively getting involved with people that as you're starting the process you're being very open about how you're willing to split things don't don't assume everybody's gonna have the same perspective as you people have completely different ideas about how they expect their contributions to be valued always up front be honest about you know, is this straight work for hire is this is this a, a share sort of deal uh, and that way later on uh, that then there won't be any hard feelings or anything weird I looked through a bunch of different drummers and I found a drummer in the UK named Emily whose uh, tone and uh, feel I liked a lot. I listened to some examples on her website and uh, checked out her gear list and etc. And I uh, just really liked her vibe and I, I reached out to her before I placed the order and uh, it just seemed very cool and, and easy to work with. So I formulated an email uh, after I placed the order and I'm going to run you through that process and, and show you what I discussed with her. Uh, now basically, you know, I just uh, talked a little bit about the format that I wanted the files in, so I recorded 48K 24-bit, so I mentioned that, and uh, and I mentioned the tempo. 
Uh, one thing I did with these tracks is that I gave one extra bar before the song starts. I think it's worth mentioning that it's not a great idea to just like start right at the top of the song in the first note. Give it a bar, give the session musician working with either a recorded click track, which is always a nice, a nice plus, and I didn't do that here, or you can just give them the BPM and make sure everything starts exactly on the grid. So when she records, everything she records, she's going to bounce down at zero. So when I bop it into my session, then everything is going to line up perfectly. Uh, so I did that. Um, I started talking a little bit about, uh, you know, some basic guidelines that, uh, how, and in, in our demo recording, I had it set up that, uh, that there were some buildups in the transitions, but I want to give her a little freedom with that. Uh, she doesn't necessarily have to do a buildup every time. Uh, she can be creative with how she feels, uh, to embellish those uh, transitions. Uh, I did talk about a reference track. Uh, I think snare drums for me are very, uh, you know, specific thing. So I didn't want a very super tight and bright snare drum. Uh, I, I wanted something that was, it doesn't have to be super loose, but not, not so like, um, high strung. I mentioned, uh, do right woman, do right man from Aretha Franklin, uh, which she cut in 1967. I made to mention that here because with an artist like Aretha, she has such a long career and, uh, and so many different versions of the song. It's important to mention, uh, when you're mentioning a reference, exactly which version you're talking about, or like I did later on in this email, I uh, I sent a link to a YouTube video of the original version of that song, just so she could you know get a vibe of, of what I was talking about with that snare drum. Uh, you know, from there on, I uh, just uh, mentioned that I didn't want the track to be too flashy, so it's not really about a lot of drum fills, uh, and uh, and I, I I stemmed everything out. I sent individual tracks. I sent the piano track. I sent my scratch drum track. I sent the guitar track. Even though that's not going to be our melding line, I wanted to give the option to have something that's a little bit more melodic. So even though like uh, there's a piano track there, it's just it's kind of plodding along, and it's not really giving a lot of information. So I thought she might like to to pop in that guitar and and, and have a little bit more of uh, you know the feel uh, exposed. When I bounce off the tracks to individual files, I uh, I also zip them. Uh, there's a an upload limit to uh, air gigs, so often what I do is I zip the files and I put them in a Dropbox folder. Uh, that way, because uh, I send them in full resolution. I don't send MP3s, I send WAV files in the exact format that I'm asking them to record in. So 48K, 24-bit uh, individual files inside of here, and actually you see the, the three different files that I have here, melody, piano, drums. Make sure you label everything very clearly. You don't want people guessing what bounce one is, bounce two is. Like Just make everything as, as straightforward and, and simple as possible. Uh, and then I, I bounced it to a zip, and I also named the zip. Remember, everything should be searchable. Uh, you know, the zip file, the individual files, labeled, named properly. Uh, and from here, uh, like I mentioned, I created a Dropbox link, which then I uploaded a link in the uh, the order for her. Uh, and then, you know, I just made a few notes here about it. Uh, I didn't include a chart for this because I felt like it was, it was pretty straightforward. Was, occasionally, like I might uh, include a chart if there's some more specific things I, I want uh, played, but I think that uh, judging by her experience and the style of playing that she she does, that I think this is gonna gonna roll out and be pretty natural for her. So Abby wrote back and basically was asking me some questions about you know, the content of the song and where to go. Uh, with the direction uh, lyrically. So I'm gonna create an order because I'm gonna have her do the vocal track. I'm gonna elaborate a little more on where I was going when I thought of the title and where it might be a good path for her to go down lyrically. On the site, you see there's an option for order right here. So I'm gonna click on that. And uh, I'm gonna use my account and balance. You can also connect to your PayPal as you saw. Uh, and here I go. I'm going to submit order requirements. And uh, so I've already spoke about it. I don't have to introduce myself again, but I'm going to take a minute here and uh, and give her a little idea about where I was going with this. Okay, so I just wrote an email to Abby, and I mentioned that my concept behind this Fool for Your Touch is that uh, it basically it's like no matter what's going on in the world or uh, whatever harsh realities we're dealing with, which it seems like a lot these days, that there is just somebody in your life whose touch just makes you 
forget all of that. It just erases all that for that temporary time being while you're together. It's as if, you know, time stops or, or you're, you're able to escape it, right? Um, so it's essentially, it's a love song between two people. I also asked that maybe she keeps it open-ended and, and not have it necessarily be about a man, a woman, uh, just to, to make it about any two people that, that love each other and are able to find that place when they're together that allows them to, to feel safe and, and to feel like, everything's going to be okay, and, and it's, they all get through it together. I'd like to mention a thing or two about this session and preparing it for other musicians. One thing I think to be conscious of is when you're quantizing, I think people want to make the timing perfect, but sometimes when they do this within Logic or, or actually whatever DAW you're using, they tend to, to, to over-quantize and not consider like, the actual feel uh, so I, I do, and, and um, I did quantize this because I, I laid this in pretty quickly, and, and I knew I was going to have somebody else playing it, so I wasn't worried about getting a perfect performance, but I wanted it to be locked down pretty good because I knew that the drummer was going to have to play with it and and uh, before the piano player and, and the bass. So uh, I did quantize it, but I went over and I played around with this swing option. So this may be located in a different area, depending on if you're using DP or Pro Tools or you know, Ableton. Uh, but I think once you quantize things, and particularly right now I have it set to a 16th note, and you'll see, you know, there's different 16th note options, right? There's different kind of swings in here. So these are kind of the presets for that. Or you can just quantize it and you can go through and you can adjust the strength and the swing to quantize it. So uh, I'll do this sometimes because... Uh, is sometimes I find that the pocket sits in between some of those presets. So uh, I laid in the piano track, it was a little out of time, so I quantized it, then I went, selected everything, and then just kind of um, moved the swing and the strength options to, to, to see how much they were gonna kind of like move around. Um, you know, with that being said, sometimes when I'm quantizing, I don't just select every single note. I might just want to, to select a section of them and, and quantize that because maybe that particular bar or those particular beats need to kind of have a slightly different swing to it because remember when you're making music, like not everything is static, right? And, and some of the greatest musicians will adjust their feel sometimes based on bars or beats. Uh, and I know it sounds like very uh, minute editing, but uh, they can make the difference when you're sending things out to be overdubbed on. So if I'm going to have a drummer play against something, I do want to make sure that the feel is right because if this is too straight, then the drummer is going to going to get the idea that this is a real straight 6/8 kind of feel where I wanted it to be not not so black and white that way. I wanted it to have a little bit of a swing to it, but it's not like a super hard swing. When I'm sending tracks to musicians to play, I also make sure not to have anything on my bus. I don't want any loud compressors or I don't put any bus compression or uh, mastering plugins on there at all. So I send it natural and I know a lot of us are gonna be like, oh, it just doesn't sound as good. But it's just, you know, sometimes those, those uh, master bus plugins add latency. Like I don't want any sort of issues when I import things back in, having anything even slightly being off. And uh, depending on how many plugins you have on there, it can also affect how much latency you have so what that means is that that can affect the timing ever so slightly so I don't do that just keep your master bus you know nice and clean when you're, you're sending it out um, just deal with raw tracks for as long as you can I was looking through a lot of keyboard players and I centered on this one named Jonathan from the UK I just felt like with his experience and his influences he would be a good match for the track that I'm doing so I sent him a message just you know, checking his availability and just talking a little bit about the project and same way that I did with uh, with Abby and Emily and uh, and I, I'm only gonna want a MIDI track from him so normally I'd want a full piano track because I love real recorded piano but I've been using the Keyscape from Spectrosonics and uh, I wanted to use it because I just hadn't really centered my thoughts yet on whether I wanted to use an upright piano or a grand piano. The sounds in, in Keyscape are, are really, really good uh, to the extent that I didn't feel like I was going to be hugely missing out on having the real piano. Uh, it's the first plugin I've really used that I've, I've felt that way. It's going to allow me to go in and you know, if I want to choose a different piano or, or change some more of the attributes about it now. 
Also, I just had a little bit of an idea in the back of my mind of you know, how would this sound on a Wurlitzer, uh, and I wanted to keep that option open. So I thought instead of having Jonathan cut two different performances, uh, one with a real Wurlitzer and one with a real piano, with two slightly different performances, I just felt I could have the same performance and then keep that vibe and if you played anything unique in that performance I wouldn't lose that right and I could just try the world or an upright or a grand piano or, uh, it just gives me a little more flexibility I received some drum tracks from Emily Dolan Davis otherwise known as Emily drums on the air gig site she's done a really fantastic job I'm really psyched about this I'm not even going to ask her any revisions she just nailed it right with the first try uh, this makes sense because we had a lot of conversations about drum tones and I think she gave the reference track or the scratch drum track I sent a really good listen before she tracked these uh, and she definitely took those concepts and, and elevated them and added a level of finesse that I think wasn't being captured with the, the loop I was playing over and over again. She also gave us a lot of really great options with microphones. She didn't just put up a couple mics and roll with it. She gave us options for like the Glenn Johns technique, spot micing, room mics. And this is really great because uh, she didn't really know how it was going to be mixed, you know, and, uh, you know, recording and producing or mixing drums tends to be one of the most challenging things. And I think working remotely even makes that a little bit more difficult. So the fact she went the extra uh, mile to give us options so that we can interpret the drum sound in a number of different ways is, is really helpful. When it comes time to mix, we may not use the Glenn Johns method at all, or we might heavily rely on the Glenn Johns miking technique. It's, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, as I'm not mixing this, if, if I was going to be the mixing engineer, I maybe would have had uh, some stronger opinions going into it that I was ready to commit to. Drums are also really difficult because of the amount of microphones that it takes to get a good drum sound and making sure that you're aware of all the phase coherency when this is going down. Uh, I've checked all these mics and she really knows what she's doing and everything's really phase coherent. All the engineered recorded sounds are really fabulous. Let's listen to a little bit of it and then I'm going to break down each of the microphones. Let's rip apart some of these tracks now. So right now we have the, the Glenn Johns right, which if we check our graph here, Glenn Johns right is the one over the floor tom. One overhead. Let's talk about processing the drums pre-mixing and it's important to have a, a good sound happening as you're working on a song but I think it's also important not to go too nuts with the processing so when I get a drum track like this that has multiple mics on it uh, I'm just going to create a bus and then I'm just going to do a little processing on the bus so for this particular drum track I put on this distressor. I really like this distressor from UAD because it allows me to do this parallel compression thing. You can see that. 
right here with this dry wet knob, right, or dry comp knob. Uh, so basically, this is I don't have to do any special routing and create a parallel drum bus or anything like that. I can I can squeeze the drums and I can adjust it to allow some of the dry sound in so that they don't get over compressed. So for monitoring, this is really just going to squeeze the drum sound together a little bit more and make it sound a little bit more uh, closer to the final result without really getting in and, and doing um, you know surgery with EQing and compressing the snare drum and all that stuff. I'm going to uh, let that to the mixing engineer. And the Distressor as a compression plugin just sounds really fabulous on drums. So, uh, I also went in and used one of the presets. I think it's worth mentioning that when you're trying to get these things up and going, it's not a bad idea to check out the presets. And a lot of these UAD plugins, and I think every plugin pretty much you get has presets, uh, use a lot of the UAD stuff. And the preset combinations that they have inside the plugins happen to be pretty well thought out. And I pulled out a, a, a parallel drum compression uh, preset on here and just use that. And sometimes I'll, I'll make a few tweaks. You check the, uh, the, the dry comp knob and uh, maybe just a few more subtle things. But again, I'm not really getting super deep into it. I just want to get an estimate of where it's going to be. All right, next week's blog, we're going to be looking at a piano track that I should be getting back from Jonathan. And we'll check in on that and see how the song's getting together. I think I should have some lyrics in place as well from Abby. I received a piano track from Jonathan Holder in the UK, which I'm really excited about. He did a really fantastic job. I managed to elevate this really simple part that I had, but also at the same time, he kept it very tasteful. It doesn't sound completely foreign to what I had started with. And I requested that he send me a MIDI track because I wanted to audition a few pianos using the Keyscape library from Spectrasonics. Omnisphere open here, which is what I'm using to run Keyscape. You could run Keyscape through Omnisphere or on its own. The advantage to running Keyscape in Omnisphere is that they have some extended libraries called the, the Keyscape Creative Library, which combines a lot of the sounds in Keyscape with Omnisphere. But for this track, I'm just using the, the straight up Keyscape library sounds. Now let's listen to the piano a little bit on its own, and then I'll start uh, switching some pianos around. First thing I'm going to do though is I'm going to bypass some of the processing that I have on the piano. Uh, I put a Fairchild on there, which I just really like on piano. And I did put the Studer A800 from UAD on there as well, just to warm up the sound a little bit. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I just I do like the sound of tape. So let's listen to the bare piano sound. Before I switch up some sounds, I just like to say that in this process, I may choose to change the piano later as I'm adding bass and guitar, and I might decide later on that an upright is more of an appropriate decision for the tune. <laughs> It's amazing how realistic it sounds. It really sounds like a, an upright that's mic'd up. Let's check out a Wurlitzer, because I might like the sound of that as well. What's 
great is these piano samples are, are extremely realistic and there's a lot of things you could get in here and adjust about it like the things in the performance all right check this out you can adjust the real noise the pedal noise velocity sensitivity uh, there's a lot of things that actually make the instrument sound like the instrument that you don't even realize like the fact that sometimes you can on a piano or a Wurlitzer or an upright that you can hear the piano pedal noise making sound as you press it or release it it's definitely triggers something in your brain that like oh this is a, a real instrument but what's nice is they they give you an option of of how loud that is now if you spent some time recording real instruments you know that uh, sometimes with certain pianos, you don't have control of how loud that pedal noise is, and sometimes it's uh, it's just it's a little too loud. Sometimes if you're, especially if you're working on like a ballad, have had that issue. So the cool thing about the the Keyscape library is that you can still have some of that that realness of a real piano, but you can you can tame that that pedal noise back a little bit. So it's it's there to to tell your brain it's a real instrument, but not so much that it's uh it's overshadowing the actual performance that's happening you can see there's also a lot of different options for the way we treat the tone and and uh, there's a lot of options i could i could really get here and here and and tweak but what i'll do is i'll basically just find the basic instrument that i want and then i'll tweak a little bit from there i'm going to go back to this grand piano because i still think that that currently is still better we don't have bass or anything in it yet and I just started with this basic grand piano sound. There's some different presets in here uh, that, that basically just have different adjustments through all these uh, settings or parameter boxes you see. Now, as I did with Emily, I'm going to send Jonathan a work for hire contract. And this should be a, a, a wash, rinse, repeat sort of process that you do with every musician you work with. I'd like to make a note about how many buses and effects that you're setting up when you're working on a song. When I'm in production for a song and I'm not going to mix it, I try to kind of keep the effects sends and returns to a minimum. It's unlikely for me to have more than two reverbs on a track. Uh, just to maybe sometimes have one dedicated to vocals and one for instruments, and this may not lead to the most refined, rough mix. But it also isn't overcomplicating things. And I think I've seen people run into issues when they're preparing stems and preparing uh, just tracks to be mixed that they have a lot of crazy effects combinations and too many sends and returns. So I often keep like a plate or some sort of general reverb on that I know like in this case I'm sending the piano to a general reverb which is a, probably a plate and uh, actually let's check that out I believe it there it is it's the EMT uh, 140 so I like this plate reverb again it's sort of a 1960s vibe so I like that uh, and I just kind of keep that on two buses and, and send some different things to it. You know, the only time I'll break this rule is if I'm specifically looking to process a part with a reverb effect, in which case like I'll probably even track with it going in or apply that effect to the individual track and, and bounce it down. But again, if, if you're gonna send things out to be mixed, try not to over complicate your effects writings and have like, you know, five buses. And I avoid a lot of the logic presets because they sometimes complicate things they to make tracks stereo when they don't need to be stereo and and there tend to be a lot more plugins than I, i'll use for any sort of uh, pre-mixing process try to keep things as simple and as raw and as honest sounding as you can until the final mix process you know if you can't get it to sound good in a rough mix it's going to be even harder when it when it gets the mix down abby sent me the first draft of the lyrics for the song as well as a rough vocal track so i can get an idea of where she was heading now this is most likely going to be the the situation where we're going to ask her the most revisions because uh, it, i didn't have any lyrics written for the song and i sent some really rough ideas on a melody line uh, sometimes when i send a song out the melody line will be laid out maybe a little more specific but this i kind of wanted to give her a little more control over where she was going with it so i just suggested a lot so it may uh, turn out that we may go back and forth a few times with a, with a few suggestions sometimes i find that i'm lost in Traveling blind, yeah, without a clue. World's running mad, but I'm glad long as you're in view. 
I think the only lyrical revision that I want is in the second pre-chorus. She uses the term full for your touch and uh, I think that I don't think it's necessary to include the title of the song in the lyrics of the song and that was a working title so there's a chance that maybe we won't even call it that. I'm going to talk to her about that as well if she has a, a better concept for the title. But I feel like uh, there could be a better line there. And it made sense to me she was trying to tie that in. So finding a spot to put that title in. But, uh, but I don't think we need it. Let's listen to that line. Most times I find that I'm only So that's it. That's the only revision lyrically. Otherwise, I think we're in, in perfect shape. Th melodically, the only thing I'm going to ask her to do is that every verse she starts with that melody line that I gave her, uh, which is the opening line. And I feel like she doesn't have to be so married to that. Um, I feel like we've heard it and maybe she could do it the second verse to the first line. But by the time that third verse comes in, I think that uh, we've heard that a lot and she could feel free to break free of that and and uh, and just experiment and make it more improvisational maybe in a way that somebody like uh, Aretha would have approached. So after these two simple revisions, we should be really good to go. And what's great is that even the scratch track she was sending recorded with a, a great microphone. So in the event that uh, I wanted to use something from that take it's a keeper even though she was just sending me some ideas i think this is really nice because uh she's running the uad apollo and i know that she can she can recall all the settings so it should sound pretty identical when she sends the new track even though it's not in the same day or close enough that if I needed to pull a line or I wanted to use a line from this early scratch take that it wouldn't be hard to do. This is a nice thing with, I think, doing mobile tracks and something I think about a lot. I use the UAD Apollo and in console, I save for the settings for every session that I do. So if I'm doing like a web session and I will be doing some tracks on this, so we'll see it. I save that. So as I do the revisions later, I pull it up and I know that all my preamp settings and compressors I was using or tape settings or anything I was using is set right back up to the, the same exact place. And that way there's some sort of consistency in sound. I think when we're dealing with these remote sessions, uh, that's one thing we have to consider a little bit more. You know, usually if you're in a real studio, you're in the control room and maybe you'll break for lunch and come back and decide you want to make a revision and everything is still set up. But it just becomes a little trickier when you know, you're recording in remote locations and it, and it takes days to, to hear back about a revision. Uh, it's likely that you probably have, have done some of the work since then and you've changed a lot of your preamp settings and stuff. So I think uh, this is where some of the modern uh, digital hardware is really powerful like the uh, apollo line of stuff because it allows you to essentially recreate that environment that you were in and uh, and i'll go as far as to to mark down all the settings in my chain if i'm using a guitar i'll mark down the volume knob on my guitar where the tone knob was take pictures of the microphone placement and uh, and uh, the knobs on the amp like i try to document every aspect of it so that i could pretty much get the same sound back and if there are some very Variances, they're going to be they're going to be pretty small variances. Don't be afraid to get a measuring rule out or get some twine or string and and uh, cut it to lengths that uh, you the, this microphone is away from the speaker or your voice is away from the microphone. Do whatever you can to actually document the distance from the sound source to the microphone. I use my iPhone a lot to take pictures uh, as well to make sure that I also have a visual perspective of the angles that the microphones were 
Pouring, we've received a final vocal track from Abby, complete with the edits that I discussed about uh, the change in the, the lyric in the second pre-chorus and uh, a little more variation on the melody line. And I think we have a, a really wonderful vocal track right now and, and I'm completely stoked about it. But let's listen to it. Uh, I think one thing to note when you're listening back, I really didn't put too much on it. I only put um, a little bit of reverb and I did put an LA-2A on it just to squish it together a little bit more, but uh, that I'm not going to print to the track or anything. It was just for monitoring purposes because, again, I'm going to leave this for the mixing engineer to play with de and compressors or any kind of limiting that uh, that person may want to do. Let's take a listen to it. Sometimes I find that I'm lost in you Traveling blind, yeah, without a clue World's running mad, but I'm glad As you can hear, it's a really great performance. Now we're gonna cut the bass track. I'm gonna approach this with a very mid-1960s mentality. This means that I'm going for a vintage bass sound, but I'm gonna use a Fender P bass with some old flats on it. I'm also gonna use some foam to kill some of the sustain of the strings down near the bridge. I'm gonna show you a picture of that and talk about that in a second. And I'm gonna run that into uh, an Ampeg B15 plug-in from UAD that basically emulates the classic, you know, soulful uh, Ampeg amp, the B15. And I'm going to split that and run the other side into an API preamp just to make sure I have a clean uh, DI bass sound for a little bit of that modern sound so we could blend that in. One of the reasons I'm, I'm going for this method is uh, I didn't want a ton of sustain at the bass, when I was messing around with the track at first, uh, I, I didn't do any muting. I tried a couple different bass amps, and the uh, the bass was just kind of overwhelming, and, and I felt uh, just masking the piano a little bit. And uh, since I'm really just an extension of Jonathan's left hand, in fact, like I'm ghosting some of the notes that he's playing in his left hand, uh, I just I didn't want to overtake the piano, right? I want to kind of sit behind it. So I find that that using the bass with a, like sort of a vintage sound and muting the strings allows me to sit a little bit better behind something and not let the, the bass kind of steal the show. Uh, muting behind the bridge is a trick that a lot of bass players use, and there's a couple different approaches we can go about to achieve this. Now, one thing you can do is, is there's this um, product from Groove Gear that they make, which basically you put on your strings and it mutes them. Uh, now the level that this it's set at by, by nature to mute it is uh, pretty tight. So I tend to use this when I want a really, really muted bass sound. So it's really gonna lock it down. Uh, when I want something that maybe is muted but has a little bit more sustain, I, I start cutting pieces of foam. And you'll see the picture here of the P bass I was using and the foam I used. It was just this break apart foam. Some bass players like to use uh, those like yellow pads that you use to scrub dishes with, the uh, one with the, the, the yellow and green on it, and they'll cut a little piece off. Uh, some prefer the sound of that. Uh, you can pretty much use any kind of foam. Uh, some may mute the sound a little faster than others. So it's worth experimenting with, but it's also worth experimenting with how much of the foam you're letting touch the strings because of course that's gonna adjust how dead it makes your sound. I'll keep like three or four different varieties of, of sponges and this uh, Groove Gear mute around when I'm cutting basses. So I give myself some options when, when choosing how much I want the bass to sustain. And I'm looking at the plugins that I was using for the amp channel for the bass sound. And as I mentioned, I'm using this Ampeg B15. Let's zoom in here and check it out. 
I didn't make much changes to it. You see that there's a, a two different sides, a 64 and a 66. I'm using the top input from the 64. And uh, the only thing I did was I pushed up the volume a little bit just so it got a little more body to it and, and a little bit more tube saturation. Otherwise, I, I pretty much left it alone because it, it just sounded right. From there, I ran it into the Studer tape machine just to give it a little bit more of that that vintage vibe i didn't change too much i didn't even turn off the noise on this particular track because i just i wanted full full vintage retro flavor as far as the di track i just used a api 312 mic preamp didn't do anything to it I left it just bare going in i used a radial di to split the signal going in so i can have one going to the instrument and put in the uad apollo so i can use the ampeg and then the other one just goes into my uh, api 312. most times i find that i'm thing I often like to do with these vintage bass sounds if I'm, I have like flat wounds and I'm using uh, the mute I do like to put a Fairchild compressor right now I just have it on the B15 I left the DI clean it's possible that if I was spending some more time actually going to mix this I might experiment with putting the Fairchild on the DI sound as well but I know that I want to process the bass amp that way so I'm going to put it on there and print it for mixing let's listen to the B15 with the Fairchild You can hear it accentuates the low end, but it also adds a really certain flavor of presence to it in, in a weird way, cleans it up, and just really like the sound. Of course, this is kind of the classic Beatles compressor, this and the Alltech, uh, but I really, really like this. So I'm going to blend this together with the DI bass sound. On the bass, I made sure not to roll off all the treble. I may have just knocked a bit back, but I didn't just roll the tone knob all the way back. It's worth mentioning because sometimes you want a little bit of that presence. I think that the mute that's on there, the foam that I was using, helps attenuate some of the high end so it doesn't come out sounding really clicky or really bright. So by keeping a little bit of the, the, the presence in there with the tone knob, it's actually a nice sort of uh, clarity that comes through occasionally on some notes that I really like. Here's a tip for those of you who may be preparing a track to send to a bass player through the Air Gigs network, and you're not a bass player yourself, but you have some rough ideas of maybe what you want to send them like a little bit of a reference to do. Uh, I think one of the things I see a lot with working with a lot of songwriters is everybody thinks that they can't write a bass part because they're not a bassist and they, uh, they stifle themselves. But I think that most people do hear what they want or they have a, a little bit of an idea. They're just intimidated by an instrument that they don't play or somehow they think because they don't play it, they can't possibly know what sounds good, but you can. And a lot of times I find that once I, I break that wall down with artists, they, they're a lot happier with the parts because they actually are getting some of their ideas out, right? And they're not just flying blind or just thinking that they're not capable of it. 
On the note of expressing yourself and finding different ways to create template bass tracks, I want to show you a combination that can work for those of you that maybe don't play bass, but you do play guitar. Um, of course, obviously the first one is just to use a software synth like this Moog, Mini Moog from, uh, from Arturia that I really like a lot. I use this a lot when I'm, I'm on the road and I don't have a way to plug in a guitar or a bass. But another option is there's a couple of apps that will convert your, your analog signal, your guitar signal, into MIDI. And the first one is Midgic. Now this is a, a, a monophonic um, conversion. But there's this other one that is from this company, Jam Origin, which is polyphonic, and you can choose monophonic or polyphonic, but it will track chords and stuff. And so this is actually really cool for if you wanna play piano using a guitar, if you're not a solid piano player, but you need to create a template track, just as I did earlier in this tutorial to send off to somebody, uh, you can use your guitar to do that, acoustic, electric guitar, anything that has a pickup in it, and these are both just a slightly different approaches, but I encourage you to, to check them out. You can download a demo in each one of them to see how it, it works with your configuration. And then uh, I often just use this um, this Moog from Arturia just to to uh, to track my bass parts with um, with while using the guitar. In the next episode, we're gonna track guitars. I'm gonna run you through that whole process of how I'm choosing guitars and amps and effects and writing parts for it, etc. Last episode, we've recorded some electric guitars. I'm going to dissect them today and talk about how I approached getting these sounds and working on and composing the parts for the song. Most times I find that I'm on to you. When I was thinking of the guitar sound that I wanted for the song, I really wanted something that was a pretty classic R&B slash blues tone. So that immediately eliminated a lot of options. Uh, I knew I was going to want to use an old style amp and I wasn't going to use a lot of pedals. So the guitar and the amp were really going to be the two main components in this. So for the first part, uh, I kind of went a little bit in like the Otis Redding uh, music camp, Steve Cropper sound, and I chose to use a Telecaster into a Tweed amp. Now, on this one, I was using a Victoria 35115, which is pretty much the Tweed circuit with a 15-inch speaker. I really like 15-inch speakers. They they're just uh, they do something nice to the high end. It's present, but it rounds it off, so it's not too shrill and sharp. And believe it or not, they're not tubby. You would think they'd be tubby, but they're not. So I make this with an AA8840 microphone. This is one of my favorite microphones for recording electric guitars. I experimented a little bit with where I was placing the mic to the cab, how far away I wanted it to be from the speaker, because this isn't always preset in my mind. Sometimes it may change on the song. Uh, sometimes with this style of music, I actually move it back more than you would expect. But for this particular song, I had it closer than I normally would for this type of sound. So from there, I ran it into an API 312 preamp, and then and into the Apollo where I put a Fairchild 660 compressor on it. This is like the go-to compressor for these classic like 60s guitar tones. Now mind you, it works on a lot of modern stuff too, so don't think it's only a retro sound, but for these chimey kind of a uh, little gritty vintage guitar sounds like it's just magic it brings out the chime 
Uh, there's something even just about the tone of the compressor, even if you're not squeezing the signal a lot, it just elevates the sound in a certain way, emulating running through those tubes and transformers, etc. Uh, so that was a big component in my sound. Of course, I ran it through the tape machine going straight in. Uh, this got printed right to the track. I tried a few different guitars before I settled on the Telecaster. I tried a 335, a Gibson Les Paul. I tried a Melody Maker with a P90 because P90s record really well. I just kept going back to the Telecaster there. I just felt like that paired with the amp and the uh, Fairchild, it just something was kind of happening there that wasn't as magical with the other guitars. I won't try every guitar I have before a session. Generally, I'll have a little bit of a rough idea of where I want it to be, and I'll try two or three max uh, and, then, and then narrow it down from there. It's a good idea to have a good concept of the identity of each of your guitars. Even before you plug them in, you should have a, a notion of, of what they're going to sound like. Let's talk about the concept of clean sounds. The clean sounds can mean different things to different guitar players, producers, and engineers. To me, a clean sound has maybe just still just a little bit of hair on it. It's not the sound of a purely naked twin reverb or a JC120. I refer to the tones of like Steve Cropper a lot for a clean sound and even the meters. And the meter stuff, although it's pretty clean, there still is just a little grit on it. I knew I wanted something more like the Steve Cropper kind of clean. And uh, to get that, of course, I used the Tweed amp, which naturally starts to get a little hairy at a, at a pretty early number and then the volume knob. Uh, so that I knew was going to help me get to this end destination of this tone. But I also knew that putting a Fairchild on and using the compressor, it could add a little bit of just the, that grit into it. So the, the amp and the compressor and the tape plug-in, between those three, I can take what would be a clean sound and just, you know, again, it's not really like a blatant overdrive. It's just it's something that has a little bit more sustain to it and a little bit more character to it. It's uh, the mids aren't completely scooped out as say if I used like a blackface amp uh, from the 60s, which the EQ curves on them are just naturally a little bit more scooped. Uh, the tweet circuit, which is why I chose, it has a little bit more mid-range in it and just a little bit more hair in, the, in the, the gain structure of it. Let's rip these sounds apart. So for this intro guitar part that I wrote, I knew that I wanted something that was just a little bit more saturated. So uh, there's two basic guitar tones in the song. Three, technically, because when I'm going to show you how I'm processing it, but really it was essentially two different guitar takes of the two different sounds. So one was the Telecaster and one was an ES-335. So the ES-335 sound is more saturated. I pushed the amp a lot harder and I used an amp attenuator, this Weber Mass 200, to uh, to just kind of allow me to, to get the amp to do the overdriving rather than using a pedal. I'll get into that, the reason why, shortly. Let's listen to the intro guitar part and I'll talk about how I got this sound. <laughs> Let's listen to the guitar parts on their own. That was a Gibson ES-335 run into a Victoria 35-115 Tweed amp. So nothing too complex there, although even though it's simple, all those parts are, are somewhat specific. I just used the Tweed. I didn't use any pedals, so that distortion that you're hearing or overdrive is actually the amp. And how I achieved this was using a Weber Mass 200 amp attenuator. It's a reactive load attenuator, which is the only kind of attenuator you want to use. You don't want to use resistive attenuators. Uh, the, or the reactive attenuators are safe for your amplifiers. Uh, what this allowed me to do is it allowed me really to push the Victoria into breakup. Uh, now you might be asking why do that instead of using an overdrive pedal. There's tons of overdrive pedals that do this nowadays, but they're not quite the same thing. I find that there's a little bit more dynamics when you actually get the amp to do the saturation, that power tube saturation happens. I would like to have the amp on the verge of almost feeding back. The reason is, is that something really magical happens like as you're sustaining a couple of notes and maybe the amp in the guitar, you're not exactly getting feedback, but it's just, it's, it's almost about to happen and uh, you just hear these harmonics kind of just 
coming out in the guitar that you wouldn't hear with an overdrive pedal playing at amp at a, at a lower volume. So I don't have the amp really loud. Uh, there was the other reason why I was using the 335 because it's a semi hollow body guitar and at a, a, a moderate level I can get that thing to start feeding back. And there's a few moments in the song where I got a little bit of gentle feedback, but a lot of the times it's just it's just on the verge. So what I did with this sound was I recorded a mono source and then after I recorded it I sent it out to an old Effectron 2 delay rack unit and used the knowledge like the delay the doubling effect on it but I used a little bit of the modulation there I think I was just kind of maybe emulating like a slow speed Leslie a little bit I think in my mind I was thinking a little bit of uh, some of the stuff that that uh, the tones that were captured on the the Blind Faith record and now I, I didn't exactly try to recreate that sound but there's a little bit of that that sort of that essence of, of Clapton in that time period, I guess I, I just wanted in this intro. It's the only spot of the song I did that in. Let's listen to the first rhythm guitar track. That I'm lost in you So for this rhythm track, I was using a Telecaster into the same exact signal chain as the 335. So really the only thing that changed was the guitar. Uh, I wasn't using the amp attenuator though. I guess that would be the only subtle difference. I had the amp naturally on about three and a half. So any sort of slight overdrive you hear is maybe just a little bit from the amp and, and from the Fairchild, uh, and that's about it. Uh, I knew I just wanted that, that, that kind of cropper, clean sound, so that was the signal chain for that. But what I did was I recorded as one performance, and there was one part where I started playing an arpeggiated part, which is right here. I thought about doing that after the fact. That was all part of one performance. So I cut that out of the track and I moved it to a new track and I reamped it actually through a full tone super trem just because I really like the tremolo on that. Uh, I find it sounds better than plugins. So I will reamp sometimes out to real guitar effects, uh, especially with something that I'm very particular over like, like tremolo. And speaking of that verge of feeding back, I added another guitar part here We're using that 335. You could hear a little bit of that feedback there, uh, and even when it's before the point of its feeding back, it actually is influencing the guitar tone. Let's talk about part writing. Part writing in a song like this, I think, is really important. I knew that I wanted it to be pretty sparse. If you listen to a lot of that Aretha Franklin and, and a lot of those soul records, uh, Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, a lot of that stuff, like there's definitely guitar in it, but it uh, it holds a different place in the arrangement. Uh, in the verses, you hear me doing a lot of stabs. And when I'm playing rhythm in the chorus, the region of the guitar I'm playing in, it's uh, on the higher strings. I'm not trying to take up a lot of bandwidth. There's piano and bass and, and all those instruments take up a lot of space. So as a guitar player, I know I'm going to have to carve a very specific spot to fit in. If you're interested in learning a lot more about recording electric guitar, I go into great detail about a lot of these topics in my tutorial series, Recording and Producing Electric Guitar with Mark Marshall. In the next episode, we're going to talk about hiring a mixing engineer through the Air Gigs Network, and then I'm going to run you through my process of preparing a song to be sent out to be mixed. Since our last blog, I've done some researching on mixing engineers and found somebody I thought would be a perfect fit for the style of the song. And on the Air Gigs Network, you can see uh, somebody by the name of Rich Crescenti. He is from the U.S. and actually is a fellow Brooklynite. Uh, I just really liked his sound examples and communicated with him a little bit through the Air Gigs Network. And just it just seemed like we uh, would be on the same page when it came to uh, you know, taste and, and, and making decisions. Uh, uh, in the mixing process. So uh, I sent him all the files. I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of him in the mixing process, but I'm also going to show you a few things that I did to prepare in order to get rich the tracks uh, to be mixed. So I'm going to switch over here to Logic. And um, 
One of the things I think it's important to do is when you're ready to send something out to be mixed, you don't want to leave um, regions that you're cutting uh, without putting some sort of fades on them to avoid pops and clicks. But these are the things that could be a real time killer for a mixing engineer. Uh, if you want to get the best out of your mixes, and this goes to every stage in the process, but the less tedious uh, background work that anybody has to do is going to give them more time to be creative and and um, to put some nice finished touches on, on your product, your mix, your recording, whatever uh, stage of the process it is. Uh, so one thing that happens a lot of times when mixing engineers get songs in is uh, people, especially when they're, they're self-engineering they tend to be pretty sloppy with their edits uh, and a pop and click that's coming through it could take surprisingly uh, quite a bit of time to hunt that down in a big mix uh, this isn't such a huge mix but uh, but on a, on a song that's a really big mix I mean you could spend over 40 minutes or over an hour actually trying to find some annoying little uh, uh, pop or click that's happening so wh whether you're using digital perform or pro tools logic Ableton they all have options for creating little fades at the beginning of endings of regions so I will go through every track solo it with headphones I think that's an, important to uh, I use these really good closed ear headphones on some shore uh, to make sure that I can get the volume nice and it, it blocks out a lot of outside noise so what I'm really just hearing is is the track and I can really uh, dissect when a little pop or a little amp hiss or any of these things are happening I try to, to just have that all nice and tight when I send it off to a mixing engineer so again I solo every single track play it through from start to finish seems time consuming but it's better that you do it from there, uh, it's going to be really important how you label the tracks. Sometimes when we're making records, as we're producing it, we create funny names for tracks because it just, I don't know, there's something that's uh, clever and, and fun to us about, you know, naming a track like, you know, underwear or something, you know, ridiculous. Uh, it's an inside joke. But by the time that reaches the, the mixing engineer, if he hasn't been through the whole proce process with you, it, uh, it's not really so much of an inside joke to them. And they're scratching their head being like, what are they talking about with this underwear track? I really don't know what it's mean, what it means, you know. This feels a little bit like, uh, like, like students giggling in the class with the, the, the teacher. And uh, it's, they, the teacher doesn't know what the joke is. So I like to make sure I, I, uh, I label everything pretty obviously, right? I want to be very mainstream the way I label things. You know, uh, Guitar, lead, uh, room mic, guitar, lead, close mic. Uh, don't make them guess. Again, it's going to allow them more time to be creative with, uh, with your mix rather than trying to relabel things and decipher what it is you know what, what one's the room mic what's uh what's going on so i went through this and uh and renamed everything because with some of these tracks organ track that was a virtual instrument uh they uh they when they got bounced they got bounced i did a bounce in place inside logic and that adds an extension to the file of bip uh, so i went through and, and made sure in the in the titles of the tracks that uh, none of that stuff existed so when rich pulled this open in whatever program he was going to use uh, all the track names would be pretty logical and, and there wouldn't be any confusions about you know, take eight or you know anything funny like that uh, so now another important thing to do is when you see this session open right now you're going to see that there's some of these small regions here uh, this is pretty typical when you're working on a song you know you punch in in sections or there's a lot of silence before and after a part you play and you cut that out because you don't want any room noise any amp hiss anything like that uh, cluttering up a mix uh, which is totally natural but by the time it gets sent out to be mixing if they're not mixing in the same session that you are right, which these days doesn't happen very often i record a lot in logic and a lot of people mix in pro tools or people are actually starting to use other programs now for mixing so what's important is that when they import everything in everything is the same length or most importantly that everything starts from the same exact spot you don't want them to have to move around or guess uh, they're not as familiar with the track so they're not going to really know sometimes if uh if a guitar track is is one bar or one beat off i mean sometimes it's really obvious and other times it's 
you're unsure if that was a creative decision or not. So I don't leave any of this gray area uh, to be um, having to be clarified later. I take care of it, and I take care of this when I bounce it out. Now in Logic, I just set the uh, the cycle region, and then uh, I just um, export all tracks. And uh, in Logic, it'll allow me to to do that, and it'll it'll export all the tracks the same length, which um, we'll see uh, in this Dropbox folder that I set up for Rich, uh, they're all in here and they all have the same exact starting point. So if I was to pull these files into Pro Tools or Ableton, they would line up absolutely perfectly. As you're exporting your files, it's important to make sure that you do pay attention to the sample rate and bit rate that they're being exported to. Uh, there are options for that in most programs. So don't just blindly hit uh, export. Make sure that you're exporting at the format uh, that you prefer or your mixing engineer wants the files at. Uh, I generally just export at the same sample and uh, bit rate that I record the sessions in, but some mixing engineers might want you to send them in a, in a different um, sample rate. Uh, I find that I'm lost in you Traveling blind, yeah, without a clue When mixing a song, I always like to ask for an instrumental version of the song. Uh, it's something that a lot of people forget to ask for. Now with uh, a lot of licensing happening, syncing for TV, movies, video games, uh, people will ask for an instrumental version of a song. So it's important to have that because you could have an opportunity to get some royalties and, and make some money. Uh, but if you don't have that, it could take a lot more time to get back to the mixing engineer, have them bounce off an instrumental version which may or may not be that easy to acquire because they may have mixed partially analog it's a really good idea to ask for this right up front from your mixing engineer to give you an instrumental version of the track uh, sometimes when you're dealing with tv and movies there's a pretty quick turnaround so uh, what they don't usually want to hear is that well you gotta give me a few weeks to uh, get in touch with the mixing engineer to give me an instrumental they simply just want you to send it so uh, always ask for an instrumental and when we get to the mastering process we're also going to have the instrumental mastered as well which brings us to our next upcoming vlog on mastering i'm researching mastering engineers now and uh, i've got the mix back from rich and this will be the final stage of our process and I'll run you through how I'm going to approach the mastering engineer and what I like and what I don't like about mastering in our next vlog so I'll see you then since our last video which was based around the mixing of the song full for your touch I've uh, I've had the song mastered I searched through the air gigs network and listened to a lot of different mastering engineers and settled on uh, somebody named George Schilling from the UK who's an excellent mastering engineer uh, I just really liked his examples and I found him easy to communicate with and 
Uh, I read through his bio and, and it just seemed like he was really going to get what we were going for with this song. Uh, so you can see his website here um, and his bio and he offers a couple of different services on here. Uh, but I, I hired him to uh, simply just to master this track. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to a little bit of the song. And you can hear how there's just a little bit more of a sheen on it. Things are just balanced out a little bit more. And, and everything sounds uh, a little bit more even uh, with the mix. Things are still going to be uh, a little uh, dynamic. And not that I had this overly compressed because uh, I asked him not to do that, uh, which is a point worth mentioning I think when you're going to work with a mastering engineer it's good to, to have a bit of discussion about uh, how much compression you're going to like are you looking for like the one of the loudest mixes like do you want it to just be like slamming uh, or do you want it to be a little bit more dynamic I prefer to have my masters be a little bit more dynamic I'm not looking for any volume wars or anything like that so uh, and I'm not trying to compete with the newest dance tracks on the radio because this is a vintage track, I wanted to keep it a little bit more dynamic. And with that being said, it's not a master straight out of the 60s. So uh, it's a little bit more present and uh, it is a little bit more compressed. Uh, but I think um, one thing that happens is a lot of people get really uptight about having their songs be the loudest that they could possibly be. And sometimes they'll compare it to a record of a genre that, that isn't really familiar to their music. So they might uh, listen to their alt country album uh, against a Foo Fighters record or a Jay-Z record and I think that um, uh, those are just different genres and so when you're you're referencing something from a master you got to make sure that you're, you're checking with something that is related to what you're working on um, so again this sort of track being a, a sort of a vintage vibe uh, I didn't feel needed to, to compete with uh, that, that pop market in that way. Uh, if I was working on a hip hop track or um, an alt uh, rock track or something of that nature, I, uh, I might want it to be a lot more compressed. So I'm not always against that. I just feel like uh, it's dependent on the, the material that you're working with. Let's take a listen to a verse of Fool For Your Touch. Sometimes I find that I'm lost in you Traveling blind, yeah, without a clue mentioning is that whenever I have a song mastered I have two versions mastered I have a version with the vocal and then an instrumental version the reason I do this is that you may eventually get an opportunity to get a song placed in a TV show or a movie and they might want an instrumental version to sit behind voiceovers uh, a lot of times they don't want songs with singing in them because it competes with the dialogue in the movie or the show uh, so I always like to have this in my back pocket now more than ever. Uh, syncing and, and placements are are a bigger deal to artists, so uh, they don't want to wait either. Like for for you to supply that. So if you forgot to have that done, and then somebody contacts you, and you have to say, well, um, you have to wait two weeks until I get the chance to uh, 
to have this remastered without the vocal. It, it, people tend to get impatient. Things move very fast these days. So uh, the best thing you can do is if somebody asks you and get that opportunity, is just to immediately be able to send it off. So most mastering engineers will uh, gladly do this, and it'll be um, it's a fairly easy task for them to do, and they'll often do it at no additional cost. But you should always clarify that and ask them for that up front, just so everybody knows what they're getting into. Before you have your song mastered, uh, sometimes I will have a conversation with the mastering engineer if they want uh, a couple of stems. So on some records I've done, the mastering engineer has asked for uh, instrumental and then um, a, a stem of the vocals. Compiling stems to send out to be mastered, uh, I would include the full mix with the vocals and everything intact, the way it was uh, it bounced down from the mix. And then I would have an instrumental with absolutely no vocals in it, no harmonies, nothing. Then I would do a stem of the lead vocal, so only the lead vocal. And then the, the fourth stem would be of all the other vocals, the harmonies, the background vocals into one. This will give the mastering engineer a lot of flexibility if, uh, if you need to change and that way you don't have to open up the session again and make some final tweaks to it and send it back and forth and eat up time uh, they'll be able to make that call in the end and and this is usually a, a stage that I trust the mastering engineer a lot on uh, every time I've had to do this and the mastering engineer has used those vocal stems it's always uh, turned out better because uh, you know they're they're the one adding the final compression and, and getting the levels up and compressing um, we aren't always exactly know what that's gonna sound like when we send a mix out well, I hope you've enjoyed this process of building a song from scratch, right from the composition, right up to the master of the process. If you liked a lot of the concepts I was talking about, and I just completed a new series on producing and recording electric guitar. Now in this series, I start from the beginning and go from the beginning of the, the signal chain, which is the electric guitar, and I follow that all the way through up into mixing. So you'll learn all my secrets about everything from, from how cabling and, and volume knobs and pedals and amplifiers and gain staging, microphones, processing with EQs and compressors, uh, all of the above, everything that, that can have the influence on the tone. And actually, you're going to get some surprises in there, which probably you didn't consider was uh, having a great impact on your tone, but it turns out it is. So uh, this series is uh, recordproduceguitar.com. You see my website right here, which gives us a little bit of a, uh, a layout of some of the concepts that I talk about in the video series. Um, this has been a really fun process doing this, and I hope everybody's gotten a lot out of it. And Feel free to reach out to me with any questions, and I'd be more than glad to, uh, to follow up and clarify any points in this video. Sometimes I find that I'm lost in you. Blind, yeah, without a clue.